your Bibles to Matthew chapter number 18. Matthew chapter number 18. By a raise of hands this morning, is anyone thankful for the grace of God? Is anyone thankful that God shows us mercy? Yes. Lastly, is anyone thankful that God has forgiven them of everything they've ever done? We read in Matthew chapter number 18 and verse number 21. The Bible says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Let's bow our heads. Our wonderful God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the forgiveness of sins that is found in your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I just pray that as your word is opened, that your spirit would move upon our hearts, and God, that you would teach us to forgive others as we've been forgiven. And God, if there's somebody here today that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, I pray uh, that today would be their spiritual birthday, that they would uh, come to an understanding that they are sinners, and Father, that they need Jesus Christ, and that they would call out to Him and ask Him to come into their heart. And God, we know that from Your Word that the second they do that, or the second we do that, that we're forgiven of all of our sins, and we thank You for that. Uh, Lord, if there's somebody here today that... Uh, has a, a grudge or is harboring resentment or anger towards anyone else, I pray, Father, that you would help them today uh, to release that, to let that go, uh, Father, so that they could live with peace and in the freedom and abundant life you have to offer. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe see you later. We are going to be going through a series of sermons over the next few weeks called Give What You've Been Given. We have been given so much by the Lord and we should not be selfish with what the Lord has given to us. As I said earlier, you're probably thinking that this series is all about money. But while it is true that we should give because God has financially given to us, this series is not really about that. It is about the fact that we have been given life, and so we should give our lives. We have been given love, and so we should give love. And we have been given forgiveness of all our sins, and so we should give forgiveness to others. Amen. The overall point is that in trying to be like our Savior, we must be willing to give to others the same things that Christ has given to us. And we begin this morning by looking at the principle in God's Word that we should forgive as we've been forgiven. This morning, uh, uh, a definition of forgiveness and what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is to pardon, to let pass, to take away or to release. Of sins, it literally means letting them go as if they had not been committed. A remission of their penalty. My definition is this. As it relates to other people who have hurt you, to forgive them is to let it go and to not seek retaliation or vengeance for the wrong that was committed. It is to pardon them from your own sense of justice and to release them unto God, not desiring for them to be punished. Let me read that one more time. As it relates to other people who have hurt you, to forgive them is to let it go and not seek retaliation or vengeance for the wrong that was committed. It is to pardon them from your own sense of justice and to release them unto God, not desiring for them to be punished. It sounds pretty easy until the last part. See, I can, I can release someone unto God. When someone hurts me, uh, you know, it, it would be very simple for me to release it and let it go and say, God, you take care of it if I knew that God was going to zap me. Isn't that true? It would be really easy just to let it go if I knew God was going to bring down the hammer, right? Annihilate it. Take him out here, God. 
Let me watch. <laughs> and so if that was forgiveness, forgiveness would be easy. Uh, but the reason that forgiveness is so difficult and challenging and hard for us is because forgiveness is not releasing them unto God so that God could take them out. Uh, but forgiveness is letting it go, releasing them unto God, and not wishing that God would harm to them. It's desiring that God forgive them and uh, that they have a right heart and a right standing with Him. That's forgiveness. And so uh, understand that this is what the Lord would desire us to do. You say, well, what's your evidence of that? Uh, because uh, I used to have a misunderstanding of what forgiveness really was. And, uh, I used to think that forgiveness was, I let it go and then God will judge them. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, say the Lord. Right? So here, God. That used to be my understanding of forgiveness. But as I began to study the subject, I came to realize that that is not the attitude of our Savior. The attitude of our Savior as He hung on a cross, He looked at those that nailed Him there, and those that whipped Him, those that put a crown of thorns on His head. He looked at them and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I look at uh, one of the first martyrs. I look at Stephen. And as Stephen was being stoned and put to death for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, he didn't say, God, uh, I let this go, but God, you take them out. Uh, no. And he looked at them and he said, forgive them. Lay not this into their charge. That's forgiveness. Uh, and that is the heart of our Savior. And that's the heart that we should desire to have as well. We ourselves have been given forgiveness. And so we should seek to give forgiveness to others. And so understanding this, let's look at the principle of this passage of Scripture. We find in verse number 21 the question that we all have today. Uh, every single one of us has had this question at some point at some time in our lives. It says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times seven? Uh, the question we all have is, how many times do I have to forgive someone? How many times do I have to forgive someone? Uh, Peter tries to get an actual numerical answer. After all, seven is the number of completion, right? And so uh, if someone offends me and hurts me seven times and I forgive them all seven of those times, I've completed it, right? I've solved the puzzle. Right? And so the eighth time, I don't have to forgive them anymore. That, that's Peter's mentality. That's Peter's mentality. That's Peter's mentality. I understand that this actually comes from a passage of scripture in the book of Amos. Uh, where it talks about 75. You see, but Jesus, uh, he takes it to another level. He takes it to another step in just a second. You see, we all feel this way sometimes. Uh, I have forgiven this person over and over again, and surely there is an end to how many times God expects me to give them forgiveness. There has to be an end to it. You may be thinking of someone right now that has hurt you. Maybe you are here today and uh, have not forgiven someone because you feel like what they did is unforgivable. We often, we try to put God and our Christian lives into a box, and that's what Peter does here. We want to know the exact rules and the exact formula until... We cannot forgive until we cannot love. Until we no longer have to show mercy and we no longer have to show grace. And so that's what Peter does is he, he puts it into this box and he says, how many times until I can get outside of this box? And we do that with God so many times in our lives. But we see Jesus answer in the next verse. Uh, notice verse number uh, 22. The answer from the very mouth of God. The Bible says here in verse number 22, Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Jesus says here that we are to forgive not seven times, but four hundred and ninety times. This blows Peter's thought right out of the box that he was trying to put around his forgiveness. And the point here is not to keep track and once someone hurts you for the 491st time, you're free not to forgive them. That's not the point that Christ is making. The point is that we are not to keep track of how many times we are wrong, but forgive as many times as we are hurt. You see, we cannot live our Christian lives with a checklist 
To truly follow the Lord Jesus Christ is not to check off all the boxes as we follow each and every rule, but it is to have a heart changed like unto that of our Savior. That's what it means to be a Christian. The Bible declares that Jesus gives grace upon grace. Listen, I'm glad that there's no end to the grace and mercy that He bestows upon us. Psalm 100 and verse 5, it says, For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. I am so thankful that God is merciful to me. To truly follow Him, I must have the same attitude towards others and extend mercy and grace as often as they hurt me. Jesus then gives an illustration for reinforcement. He often did this. Uh, he would speak in par parables in order to prove the point that he's trying to make. And that's exactly what he does here. In verse 23 uh, to 34, we see this uh, parable that Jesus gives. And we see, first of all, uh, in verses 23 to 25, we see, we see that there is a servant who owed the king an unpayable debt. It says in verse 23, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had in payment to be made. See, this servant, he owed his king, his master, his Lord, an unpayable debt. A debt that he could never pay. Understand that in this parable, the king is a representation of God. And we all are like this servant. It states that God will take account of all the things that we have ever done in the word of God. The Bible declares that one day we will all stand before him in judgment. This individual, this servant, he owed the king 10,000 talents. A little bit later we will discuss about how much this actually was. But I want you to understand right now that this was an unpayable amount. This servant could never have paid this off in his entire lifetime. Or his children's lifetime. Or his grandchildren's lifetime. Or his great-grandchildren's lifetime. Or great, great, great. Understand that this amount that he owed, uh, that it was unpayable, he never, ever, ever would be able to pay back. It says in verse 25a, it says, he had not to pay. Uh, this is how we are to God. Because of our sin, we owe him a debt that we could never repay. Now listen, you can try to work your way to heaven. Uh, you can try to give your way to heaven. But understand that it doesn't matter how much you work. It doesn't matter how much you give. You are going to fall short. You are never going to be able to pay back the debt that you owe unto God. And so the servant was to be punished. We see in verse 25, the Bible says this. It says, but for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. You see, because of our debt, we are given over to another master. Uh, we are sold under sin. Understand that because of our sin, our master is the enemy. Our master is the devil. Uh, we are slaves to him and slaves to sin. We talked about that last week. Uh, and so understand what this servant does in verse 26. is He humbles himself before the king and he begged for mercy. Verse 26, it says... The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. This is exactly how salvation works. We don't try to act as if we have not sinned, or, or that we don't owe the debt. But we humble ourselves before the king and beg for mercy. That's how salvation is obtained. A lot of people in the world today, they say, I'm a good person, or uh, that... They pretend like they're okay, that they're not a sinner. Listen, until you realize you're a sinner, you can never be set free from your sin. Right. To understand that salvation, it doesn't come by uh, ignoring your sin or acting like it never happened or acting like you've never done anything wrong. 
Uh, but it is by acknowledging that you owe the debt and getting down and begging for mercy. You see, the king had compassion uh, on him and forgave his unpayable debt. Notice verse 27. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Remember that this debt was unpayable. This man would never have been able to pay it off. But this man, he humbles himself before the king and he begs for mercy and he says, I will pay it. I will pay it. Uh, just give me time. Understand there isn't enough time. The king looks at him and he has compassion on him. His heart is moved for him uh, and he forgives him of the unpayable debt. When we repent of our sin and ask the Lord to save us, and He has compassion on us and He wipes our slate clean. We are forgiven of everything we have ever done wrong or will ever do. We see in verse 28 that then this servant, this one that had all of his debt erased, had all of his debt forgiven, uh, he is let go. Uh, we see his response in a similar situation. In verse 28, we find that the servant went out and found a fellow servant who owed him a small debt. In verse 28, it says, But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. The servant goes out and finds someone who owes him a small amount. And demands that he pay. Demands that he pay. He owed, uh, he is owed 100 pence or 100 denarii. Now, I'll explain later what that actually means and how much that actually is, but understand that this amount is much, 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 much smaller than the debt he was forgiven. The fellow servant, he humbles himself and begs for mercy just uh, as he himself had done to the king. And we find in verse 29, uh, it says, And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And verse 30, And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. You see, the one who was given great mercy and forgiven of his unpayable debt would not show mercy and forgive the small debt that was owed to him. Now something that's necessary for me to point out this morning is that what you have here is you have a king. And the king has servants. Understand that the king is above his servants. But understand that all the servants are on the same level. They are equal. And so what we have is we have this servant that, uh, that owes everything to this king. He owes everything to this Lord, to this master. But he could never pay it. And so he falls down before the king and he begs for mercy and he begs for grace. And the king has compassion on him. And he forgives him of his debt. So then the servant, he gets up and he goes out and he finds one of his fellow servants, the Bible says. In other words, uh, an individual who is equal to himself, who is equal to him, uh, and he owes him a small amount, uh, and he says, give me what you owe me. And so his brother, his equal, falls down Begs. But he's not willing to show mercy. He's not willing to forgive. How awful is it? Again, this king is representative of God, understanding that we are like that servant and have been forgiven of an unpayable debt uh, that we owe unto him. Uh, and, and the lesson here is that we should forgive others just as God has forgiven us. We are worse than this wicked servant 
When we fail to forgive other people, do you understand? In verse 31, the Bible says here, it says, So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity? On thee. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all the debt that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespass. You see, we must understand that the debt that we had because of our sin was unpayable. We have sinned against the Almighty and we deserve to be thrown into hell. But he offers us mercy and does not give us what we rightfully deserve. But instead, he wipes all our debt away when we ask Jesus to save us. Amen. Now this morning, I want you to think about the worst thing that has ever happened to you. The worst thing that's ever happened in your life. And what I'm going to say is going to hurt The worst thing that has ever happened to you in your life is small in comparison to what our sin did to Jesus Christ. That thing that, uh, that we hold on to that hurts us so much that we can't seem to get over, we can't seem to let go, we can't get, uh, seem to stop thinking about it, understand that in comparison to what we did to the Son of God, that it is a small thing. You see, the Bible declares that because of our sin, uh, that we deserve hell. And your sin, and my sin, murdered, crucified the very Son of God. Now, I understand that he willingly gave up his life, uh, and he died for you, and he died for me. But I want you to understand this, that it was our sin that put him there. Understand that if no one else existed on the face of this earth, and it was only you, he would have died on that cross for you. You would have had to drive the nails through the nails. He died for your sin. To pay off the debt that we could never repay unto God. Uh, and so listen, uh, we should likewise give forgiveness because we've been forgiven much more uh, than has ever been done to us. We must forgive just as we've been forgiven. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13, it says, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do You may say, I can't forgive them. You don't know what they did to me. But maybe it would be better this morning if you really understood who forgiveness or unforgiveness actually hurts. You see, unforgiveness hurts you. Unforgiveness hurts you. Do you understand that, uh, that having an unforgiving attitude and an unforgiving spirit, uh, that it can actually cause sickness? Yeah. It can actually cause sickness. I have known people who have become physically ill because of their unforgiveness and hatred for someone else. Unforgiveness can actually deteriorate, deteriorate your body. I once knew a man who was in his very early 60s, and he looked like he was about 85, 90 years old. And this man had, by all appearances, looked like a drug addict or an alcoholic. He had all of the, the signs and the wear and tear that you would expect to see from someone who 
was addicted to one of those things. The only thing is, is that this man never did drugs. This man never drank. Understand that this man, he was actually diagnosed as a schizophrenic. But yet all the medications and things that they tried to give him would do nothing for this man. And uh, after much time and counseling and prayer and study with this man, I came to the understanding that what this man's actual issue and his actual problem was, was that he was holding bitterness and resentment. For a long time towards someone that did something to him as a child. Then, after much, much more time and study of the Word of God, this man finally came to the place where he let it go. Instantly, this man's health began to change. You see, unforgiveness uh, and the attitude of bitterness, when we have that inside of us, understand that it causes sickness in the heart. It causes sickness in the heart. And it can have negative effects on your physical health. I want you to think about something with me. If you're mad about something, uh, or at someone that has done something to you, uh, and you lay in bed at night, and you think about that. I think all of us probably, you know, we were raising hands earlier, I, I don't want you to raise your hand now, but I think all of us probably, uh, if I were to ask you to raise your hand, could raise our hand and say that that has happened to us at some point in our life, where we were laying in bed at night, uh, and something that someone did to us upset us. I want you to, to think about this with me. It, is that uh, a lot of times the attitude and the mentality is is that I, I'm going to hold on to this uh, and I'm going to get them. Uh, I'm going to get get uh, back to them for what they did unto me. And we think about it and we think about it and we think about it all the while. They're laying in bed sleeping fine. So who is actually being hurt? We are. You see, unforgiveness, it doesn't hurt that other individual. It doesn't hurt that other person. Uh, it hurts us. That's why we have to let it go. Not only does it hurt you, but understand it hurts your relationship with God. It hurts your relationship with God. Understand that you cannot serve Christ as He desires for you uh, if you harbor resentment, a grudge, bitterness, in your heart. If you are unwilling to forgive, it will hold you back from service to Him. It will hinder your relationship with Him. You will never become what He wants you to be. See, here's the thing. Uh, is that it hinders our relationship with God uh, in, in a couple different ways. Understand this. Uh, that unforgiveness, it hinders our prayers from being heard. Mark chapter 11, verse 24 to 26, it says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. But then there's another condition. It says, And when ye stand praying, forgive. If ye have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Psalm 66 and verse 18, it says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. When we fail to forgive others, our fellowship with God is hindered. Matthew 6 and verse 12, uh, in the model prayer, uh, as Jesus is showing them how to pray, a statement that he makes is, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You see, a lot of Christians can't understand why the power of God is not evident in their lives. All the while, they are harboring resentment towards other people for things that have been done to them. 
If you want the power of God working in, in and through your life, you must be willing to forgive and let go of the hurt that is inside. Not only your relationship with God, but it also will hurt your relationship with others. There's been many families that have been torn apart because of unforgiveness. It doesn't even have to be that someone isn't forgiving someone within the family. They could be holding on to something that has happened to them 30 years ago, and it has a negative effect on their family now. Unforgiveness is like a poison, and it will hurt all those who are surrounded by it. You may not even see the effects right away, but eventually you will find that some damage has been done. There have been a lot of people who never step back into church because they are unwilling to forgive someone who hurt them. Often the ones who hurt them are gone. Yet they label all Christians the same and hurt their own spiritual lives and even the spiritual lives of their families because they are unwilling to forgive and to let it go. So we understand that God wants us to forgive and that unforgiveness actually hurts us more than anyone else. But the question this morning is, how do we do it? How do we do it? You see, here's the thing, is that all of us here know uh, that we're supposed to forget, right? The, the, Bible, the Bible is very clear about that, and we know that we're supposed to forgive other people, but the thing is, is that, how? See, some of us have had some things happen to us in our lives that are very, very, deep uh, and, and have cut us to the very core of our soul and of our being and, and it hurts. So how do I forgive? See, here's the thing is that I've known people that wanted to serve God. They wanted to be on fire for God. They just couldn't let go of something that happened. I'm reminded of one individual that the church would be taking the Lord's Supper and this individual would always sit out. Because they knew, they understood what the Bible teaches, and, uh, and that's that if you harbor resentment towards someone else, that you should not partake. They just weren't. They understood that, uh, but they weren't willing to go through the process of letting that go. How would uh, Seven quick things this morning, and understand that uh, that we can talk for weeks about this. <clears throat> Understand that this is a very deep subject and a very deep issue. And, uh, but, but first of all, uh, the first thing that we must do is we must recognize that we have been wrong. Recognize you feel wrong. Listen, it's just like with sin. Until we recognize we have sin, we can never have salvation. Likewise, with, uh, with forgiveness, uh, until we realize that there's an issue, or admit it, there can never be a solution. And so we have to recognize that we feel wrong. Sometimes we try to act like we are not bothered by certain things. We often try to cover it up or to mask how we really feel. As Christians, we even feel like something is wrong with us if we are hurt or offended by someone. You've been bothered by something. You've been hurt by something someone said or something did, uh, and you thought, "Well, I'm, I'm a child of God. Why, why am I hurt?" Listen, it's not a sin to feel wrong. But it is a sin to lie to ourselves and pretend like we have not been hurt when we have. If not handled properly, our hurt can set us on a path of destruction. And this is why we must recognize our hurt and deal with it properly. 
when you feel hurt, it's a good time to get alone with God and say that out loud. Yes. Tell Him. Understand that when you pray to God and you talk to God, God wants you to be honest. God wants you to be open. God wants you to share everything with Him. The good and the bad. Amen? And so, uh, when we're feeling wounded, when we're feeling hurt, when we're feeling offended, it's a good time to get along with God and tell Him that, God, I am hurt because of this. Secondly, put yourself in the shoes of your offender. Uh, and, and what I mean by this is not uh, uh, that you did the same exact thing or you would do the same exact thing that they did. Uh, but what this means is try to understand why they did what they did. Or maybe it is something that you will never understand. But put yourself in their place and realize that you have hurt others as well. All of us have hurt other people. All of us have offended others. Uh, all of us have done wrong. Uh, and so put yourself in that place, in that position. You see, you are not an innocent person, but have hurt God with your sins and your actions. And we must understand who we really are. And understand that we fall short of God's perfection. See, when we fail to forgive or we choose not to forgive, it's because we are actually playing the Lord over someone else. And so understand that, uh, that, that we are not anyone else's judge. We are not anyone else's Lord. But, uh, but as in the passage of Scripture, we are fellow servants. We are equal. Thirdly, look for a ministry opportunity. Realize that your situation can be used to minister to other people. Your story can be viewed not simply as a negative experience, but as a way to show others how God brought you through and how the power of God can help us to forgive even the most heinous of circumstances. Do you remember in Charleston, South Carolina a couple years ago? Where a young man shot up that predominantly African American church. And he did it because he was a racist. Now, my initial thought, and I don't know about you, but I'm being honest with you this morning. My initial thought is that if someone did this here, that my reaction may not be pleasant. But I remember watching the news. And I remember some of the survivors. And they said this. We forgive him. This is right after he did. We forgive him. And we're praying for him. And that God save his soul. About that for just a second because they used that opportunity for ministry. They took this awful situation, this horrible thing uh, that, this, that this individual did, uh, and, and instead of giving in to what the devil would have them to do and respond in the flesh, instead what they did is they used that opportunity to promote Jesus Christ and the power of forgiveness in the situation. Yeah. They ministered to millions of people, including me. Slap me in the face. Literally challenge me, maybe look in the mirror and ask myself this question. Are you that forgiving? <clears throat> you see, uh, some of us ha have situations and stories and hurt that is very deep and it is very awful and it is very nasty and it's very ugly. But understand that there are other people out there that have those circumstances and those situations too. And if you are able to, the power of God and His Holy Spirit, able to let that go and able to forgive that individual, God could use you for a ministry opportunity to help someone else who's hurt you. Yeah. Right. Not only 
Look for opportunity for ministry. Not only put yourself in the shoes of the other person. Uh, not only recognize that you feel wronged. But fourthly, choose love over hatred. Choose, choose love over hatred. Uh, be kind, not right. Do you understand that that's not just a cool thing to say? That's a biblical principle. You like to be right, don't you? Every single person in here is a private person, right? We all struggle with pride, right? The, the pride of life, the, the pride of our flesh. Understand that we like to be right. But we should be kind, not right? Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32, it says, And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You want to know uh, a key to having a successful marriage? Be kind, not right. <laughs> All you men are always wrong. Your wife is always right. <laughs> The Bible teaches in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that love is kind. Love is kind. And so understand that, uh, that we should seek uh, to be loving. We're going to talk more about that next week. But uh, love is kind. And it does not mean that we always have to be right. It doesn't mean that we must be right. If your goal is for justice to always take place, then you will have a hard time forgiving others who hurt you. Pray for those who hurt you. The Bible says in Luke chapter 6, verses 27 and 28, it says, But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. You see, Jesus raises the standard. <coughs> that you can do to help you forgive those who have wronged you is to pray for them. Yeah. Now, do not say, I'm going to pray for my enemies. I'm going to pray that they get what's coming to them. <laughs> or, I'll pray that God just annihilates them. We should pray that they are given leniency by God, who is the judge of all the thoughts and intents of our hearts. Pray for their well-being. If they don't know Christ, pray that they will be saved. Let me share with you a key. And that key is this. Did you know that your life would begin to match your prayers. In other words, the things you pray for, that is what comes out of your life. Do you want to change your attitude? You want, you want your heart to change? Start praying in that direction. Your heart will follow the prayers that come out of your mouth. And so you want to forgive someone, you start praying for them, even if at first, right, uh, you still have that anger, you, you are still upset, uh, you, you can't seem to let it go, you start praying for them, you start praying for their well-being, you start praying that God uh, will get a hold of their heart and their life and that they will be forgiven of their sins, all of a sudden, next thing you know is your heart really starts to feel that way. is that to forgive, we must forget. We've all heard that in our lives, right? Forgive and forget. Every, every single person here has heard that. It's a load of nonsense. It's a load of nonsense. It is humanly impossible for you just to forget. Do you realize that? And so people that, people that say that, they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, it, it's humanly impossible for you just to, there's no switch inside of your brain, right? I'm going to flip this switch, and I just forgot. <laughs> I wish there was. 
How would you like to forget every sin that you have ever done, right? How would you like to just flip a switch and you just forgot those horrible, awful things that you did that you were not proud of? Anybody? Let me tell you why God gives you a memory. You know why God doesn't want you to forget those awful things you've done in your life? Because that's what prevents you from doing it. Knowing where you have come from helps you to be thankful for where you are today. And so, uh, listen, those, those things that you're not proud of, that you're ashamed of, that you did before, listen, once you have made that right with God, once he has forgiven you of that, uh, remember, he, he, he's erased it from his memory, praise God. Uh, but understand that when you think about that thing, uh, don't think about it in the sense that, uh, you know what, I feel guilt for what I did in the past. Listen, you can't change what you did in the past. You can change what you do today and tomorrow. And so here's the thing, is that I'm not going to live in guilt for the rest of my life, but I'm going to remember what I did, uh, and I'm going to remember that God has forgiven given me of it, and then I'm going to not make that mistake. Yes. Yes. Likewise. Forgive and forget doesn't make any sense. You can't just flip a switch. I understand God, God does, right? God, God can choose to block things from his memory or from his perspective or point of view. We can't do that. And so, you, you can't just forget about it, but listen, what forgiveness is, is forgiveness is letting go of the sense of justice and vengeance that comes with that. See, here's another common misunderstanding about forgiveness. Forgiveness and trust are not the same thing. See, a lot of people, they think that, you know what, well, the Bible teaches that you're supposed to forgive me, and so I've done this to you, and now you have to trust me again. No. In fact, the Bible says to be wise as serpents. Wisdom's a good thing. Amen? Listen, God gave us uh, some common sense for a reason. When I go up into the woods and I see a bear, right, I don't go hug it. <laughs> so, so listen, here he, Here's not what I'm saying this morning. I'm not saying that every time someone wrongs you, and Jesus is not saying that every time someone wrong, wrongs you, uh, that you forget all about it, and you trust that individual as if uh, as if they're trustworthy. No. Uh, listen, someone wrongs your house, you don't go open the door for them tomorrow. And so uh, that's not what he's saying. But what he is saying is that you seek him, uh, and you pray for that individual, and you let go the judgment that you would cast on them. So the last thing, the most important one of all, it's a lesson that Jesus taught. Remember that you have been forgiven. You see, I, I can't let go. I can't, I can't release what that person did to me. Remember, you, you were on your way to hell. And wipe away your so that now you can have eternal life. Go to heaven. See, here's the thing. In the passage that we read in Matthew chapter number 18, is that this servant comes, and the Bible says there uh, in verse number 23, it says that he owes this king 10,000 talents. Now, he goes out and after he's forgiven of this unpayable debt, this, this huge number, he goes out and it says that somebody else owes him a hundred pence or a hundred denarii. In 2010 at Biola University, there was an article written about this explaining the difference in these numbers. Understand this, that a denarius was equal to one day's work. And so one denarius was one day's pay. Remember that this servant that owed him, he owed him a hundred of them. And so he owed him a hundred days work. Or one third of a year's salary. 
That's, that, that's a, a pretty sizable amount, right? But understand this, that one denarius, uh, excuse me, one talent was equal to 6,000 denarii. And so the amount that he owed to the king was equal to 20 years worth for one denarii. It would take 20 years uh, just, just to earn one denarii. And then after that, you have 9,999 left to go. You see, the amount that he owed this king, uh, you know how long it would have taken him to work that off? It would have taken him 200,000 years. 200,000. And so what you have is you have 100 days worth of work versus 200,000 years of work. The writer of this article, uh, he presents it, uh, for, again, it was written in 2010. In 2010, the minimum wage was $8 an hour. And so he presents it this way, is that one, one third of a year's salary was about $11,000. But comparatively speaking, the amount that would have been owed to the king was equivalent to over seven billion dollars. Here's the, the point of this passage, and here's what Jesus is trying to get across, is that, listen, is that because of our sin, we have an unpayable debt, a debt that we could never pay back. And when we who fall on our face before Him, and we beg Him for mercy, we ask Jesus to come into our heart and to forgive us of our sins. The Bible declares that we are forgiven of everything we've ever, we've ever done wrong. It is all wiped away. It is all washed away. We have a clean slate. And now we are righteous before God. We're right with Him. Uh, now, uh, the Bible even says that we can boldly approach the throne of the King. It says we boldly approach the throne of grace. And so, thanks be to God for that. But listen, when we fail uh, to, to forgive forgiveness to others, we're failing to realize how much we have actually been forgiven. Yeah. Listen, you may be here this morning and maybe you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart and be your sin. He wants to save you today. He wants to wipe away every sin that you've ever done. All that requires is this, is just as the passage said, it said you fall before him, and you beg for his mercy. You humble yourself. You recognize that you're a sinner before God. And you ask him to save you from those sins. If you do that, Jesus will save you. He wants you. You may be here this morning and you might say, I already know Christ is my Savior, but... There's some hurt inside. There's something that you're holding on to. Remember the basic thing of forgiveness. Letting it go. Releasing it. Would you let it go? Would you come to this altar? As Brother Clint saying that song this morning. Would you come to this altar? Get on your face before God and say, God... You might be here, and you might find yourself in this situation where you say, "Well, I have, I know that I've forgiven people, but yet it, it keeps because I can't forget. It keeps coming back into my mind." Here's the thing: is that the devil will use your past hurt to try to give you problems today. That's all part of not living in the past. Listen, once you've forgiven someone, once you've released it, once you've let it go, as it comes back into your mind at some point or some time in your life, you need to pray to God and say, God, the liar, he's speaking to me. He's trying to bring this back up when I've already let it go. God, I don't want to take hold of this again. God, I'm giving this back over to you.